Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Eric Hunley. He's the host of the podcast Unstructured, where, as advertised, he has unstructured conversations with some of the world's most interesting people. Sound familiar? Well, Pete was recently a guest, and he was unstructured on there, too. Eric's show is solid and established with over 100 episodes and some guests we'd all recognize besides Pete. It's a good show. You should check it out, unstructuredpod.com or whatever app you're listening to us on, too. In the co-pilot's chair with O. Pedro is Jason Piccolo, who guested with us just a few episodes ago, and he's on TV and podcasts all the time, so the three of them discuss interview technique and tell podcast stories and go way inside. It's a fun look at the machinations and the business of media that's unique, and we think you'll enjoy it. So get your ear holes ready for Pete, Jason Piccolo, and our guest today, Eric Hundley. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Easton. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Eric Hunley of the Unstructured Podcast, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, it's just going to be a fun episode. So three different podcast hosts all talking about the craft of interviewing and podcasting and whatnot. Er Eric's got a legit show. He's had guests like we've had. We've had, uh, well, heck, we put Jason Piccolo up today. You had Jason Piccolo about two weeks ago. Uh, You've had Jordan uh, Harbinger. We've also had Jordan Harbinger on a couple of times. So we share a lot of uh, taste and guests, and I've, I've been on your show. I've been on the Instructor Podcast, and it's always an honor to get invited to folks' shows. So thank you, one, for having me. Thank you for coming on my show. And I'm looking forward sure. to just sort of digging into how we do what we do, to just to give the audience a little look behind the, uh, the, the podcast curtain, because there's a lot of folks out there doing this, and everybody kind of has the desire to do it. So let's give them an idea of what that takes. What do you think? Sure, sounds great, man. And thanks a lot for having me on, seriously. Oh, no problem. And then my co-host, who's about to come into studio here, is Jason Piccolo, who happens to be today's guest, featured guest on the Break It Down show. And he has a show called The Protectors Podcast, and it's about first responders. I also have been a guest on that show, so uh, we're all scratching each other's backs. But this is one of the things about the podcast world that I found, Eric, is that you can go on somebody else's show and expose yourself to their audience in a way that you can't do on radio or anything else. You know, I, I can I can right now send an email to KGO, the San Francisco station where I grew up, and get blown off a hundred times. You know, sure. I, I could have the same exact guests as them, and they won't respond for whatever reason. Just, and you know, I don't get why people don't respond in general, but... In the podcast world, you're like, hey, you scratch mine, I'll scratch yours. And then my audience wants to hear this stuff. They want to hear how we, you know, I have a way of structuring questions. I know you do. I have a way of running my show. I know you do. Jason, same thing. So let's talk a little bit about that. And when you when you built the, the Unstructured Podcast, first let's talk about your format and how you developed it and then how much it's evolved since you started. Cool. Hey, I want to make a point about the industry though you are completely right about supporting each other i feel like in general in the podcasting world there's an abundance mentality versus a scarcity mentality right literally it's a hey you come on my show a few people may check out mine they may not check out mine but it's fun we're hanging out we're having a good time and we're both getting exposure to each other and each other's audiences and we're learning so it, it is very unique in that and I think part of it is because of the decentralization of the actual medium. And now as far as my show goes, well, it took me over 10 years to actually get off of the ground. <laughs> I, I, uh, I often joke that I am a professional podcast listener. Uh-huh. Okay. I've been listening to podcasts so, since I heard them on an iPod mm-hmm. back in 2004, 2005. So I've, pretty much followed them not since the very beginning but pretty close to it um everybody down or from i think near where you grew up uh petaluma's not too far from there is it that's pretty close it's in the general vicinity yeah yeah okay so the uh twit network um this week in tech with leo laporte all of his shows came out of there and the first show i really got into is mac break weekly 
and I'm a big Mac guy yeah. and thought, wow, this is so cool. I should do a podcast. Maybe I'll do one about Macs. Right. And, you know, and then, of course, the iPhone came. I'm a very slow starter. So <laughs> a couple of years later, that comes, and I'm like, well, maybe I could do it on the iPhone. I mean, I'm, I'm a technical guy, but I'm listening to all the shows who are doing it, and Leo Laporte's a professional broadcaster. I'm like, well, who's going to really want to listen to me on that? Oh, boy. Yeah. So then I was like, hmm, maybe I'll do it on running because in 2012, so more years later, I started running. I've done some marathons at 50K, but I never really got it off the ground. And my solution was to just keep buying more equipment. So that was actually going to move me forward. Right. I forgot the fact you sort of have to use the equipment yes. for it to be useful. No roadblocks uh, now that I have the gear. No roadblocks at all. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Wait, wait. Oh, I better get that next piece of gear. So I really mm -hmm. can't start until I get that. Right. Well, then I just never really got off the ground. And I think it was a matter of, well, I loved running. I was eaten up by running. I listened to every running podcast. But there's only so many stories and there's only so much to talk about. I then moved on to, during this whole time, I've been listening to audiobooks like Malcolm Gladwell, Freakonomics, Jonathan Haidt. Sure. Um, just a, a lot of, I don't know what you would call the genre, some pop psychology, just different sociology, things like that, some economics. And I was just fascinated by these people. And I happened to catch a, few Joe Rogan shows and I watched those and I heard Sam Harris griping about another guest on Joe Rogan. Now I'm a contrarian. So I'm like, well, who's this Hunter Mott's guy that Sam Harris is whining about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I went and looked back at the episode and saw that he had Hunter Mott's in the third hour chided the hell out of Sam Harris. But I was like, Oh, the dude's not that bad. Let me, let me check him out. He's a co-host of Brian Callen for the Brian Callen show. Okay. And I was like, okay. And so I went to listen to it and it was right about the time they were changing their name of the show to mixed mental arts. Okay. But I went to listen to it and I was like, holy you know, cow. They had Jordan Peterson on before he was a name. Right. They had every author you could think of like John Rady and um, Norman Deutsch, he, these brain scientists. And I was like, this is so freaking amazing. So I got totally caught up into it and join the community. Okay. Problem is that, well, I was the dumbest guy in the community, probably. <laughs> well, there is that. So, <laughs> well, what are you going to do? So I decided, you know what? Um, let me start out my own show and just make it, you know, much more approachable. I could try to talk to these same people, but maybe on a more pub level because I'm, you know, feel like I'm more of a blue collar mentality. Right. Or soldier, what? <laughs> yeah. Wait. So okay. So you're you're ten plus years in the making to get going and everything, but there is a moment where you're you know I can't I can't stand the more I'm going to do this. Do you remember when that was? Where you're like, God, what I I have everything I need. I'm just going to start recording. Yeah. Ironically, it was because my final act of cowardice was I was looking at having this other guy co-host with me. Okay. Because I was like, okay, if I get a co-host, that'll just take so much off of my shoulders. And right. I want to go over that with you, too, because I, I think you'd agree with that. Yeah, but, well, listen, I think a co-host is huge. And I want to go back to one thing you talked about, the scarcity mentality. And I actually want to hold our, our, our mutual friend, Jordan Harbinger, accountable a little bit. Because um, I've he's been on my show twice. I've almost been a guest on his show twice. But he's never quite gotten over the hump on on uh having me as a guest um and not that i don't have the chops to do it because i can talk spying and and culture with anybody but we just have never gotten around to it but what I, what aggravates me a little more and i don't mind saying this publicly because it's true is i'll have him on the show and i'll do my best to represent his brand well and support support him and expose my audience to his audience but he won't share that episode in his oh, network God, they don't you know, guests don't share for shit. Yeah. And, that, and that's, oh. a, and it's not just Jordan, but there are a lot of guests that do share. But so, so if you the are bigger, a, they are the less likely they will, but that's not, 
the best policy though, right? Like, like here's an area where people want to hear more from you. They don't just want to hear you behind the mic as a host. They want to hear Jordan as a guest. They want us to dig into things they don't know about. And by not sharing those things, instead of humanizing themselves, they dehumanize themselves just ever so slightly. And look, uh, I agree, but Jordan, I'm going to push back. I've got a rep for being contrarian a little. Yeah. Yes. Well, you can and push I, back, I but let me finish my point with this thing. Oh, sure. But the thing with Jordan is that he doesn't need my help getting, getting, you know, an audience, but in general, if you practice that art of being more communicative, if you're, if you're the, you know, the charm guy, um, and, and this is not just Jordan, it's anybody who, who comes on. It's like, look, pay the bill back by saying, exposing my good work to your audience so they can find another good thing, another good representation of you. And that part, I don't exactly get. I mean, I, I, I expect every guest is proud of what they create and so that they want to share it. I, I know that's not true for everybody. And, and I am holding Jordan a little bit unfairly to task. I'm glad to admit it. But I think in general, any guest, like, I, so here's an example. I had Jason Piccolo, who's going to join us in a second here. I had him on my show today and he shared it out. He posted the link because I sent everybody the HTML file so they can share it on their website. And he, he's available. He's like, look, I'm out here in this space talking, doing these things. And it gives your audience, even if they don't know you, another chance to find you, even if it's people from my audience. I don't mind colliding audiences and seeing what happens because it's good for everybody. So I just in general, I think, I think guests and hosts need to work more on sharing the things because the more people can encounter, like my episode with Jason is fantastic. I, I dare anybody to listen to that and not find it to be interesting. Now, you were going to challenge, so please go ahead. Okay, well, first off, on the premise, I totally agree. I wish the guests would share more. Now, I could speak very specifically to Jordan Harbinger's case. Okay. Um, I'm not completely defending him. If Jordan was to share every episode he was on, his feed would be everybody else's show but his own. Now, that it could be criticized saying, hey, wait, you're riding off of everybody's back. And as a matter of fact, I did in my interview talk to him about that, that are you an expert interviewer or are you really more of an expert guest? Because your brand and your name was built on guesting. And, and he agreed. It was a, you know, a great interview. So I kind of mm -hmm. understand it in the sense of he's building his brand. And if he shared it all the time, it would just overwhelm the feed and his audience doesn't want to hear about every other show in the world. But then on the same token, it's like, well, wait a minute, you are, you know, some people could feel like they're being used here a little bit, even though, you know, my audience is a, a pittance compared to his. And yeah. a lot of others' audiences is a pittance compared. But we all, our little pittances have all added up over time. Sure. And, and there's something to be said for, you know, Jordan's time is valuable. Everybody's time is valuable. But, you know, he's, he's giving an hour and that's already a lot you know, at the rate that he bills out at. And, and I get it that he's a guest on a lot of things, but if you're going to post on social media, why not post a show that you're on? You know, like I, I will say this, no matter how big I get, if I'm on someone's show, when they put that show out, I'm going to do my best to post that thing. I might miss one here and there, but I will never be so big that I can't, represent someone else's work that I'm a part of. I would be proud of, I'm proud to be on someone else's show, you know, so. Oh, I am too. And my way of doing that is, or, you know, my mentality is that I will not go on too many shows that I can't actually promote them. And, and when you say it's promote, unfair. like it can be a tweet, just tweet the fuck I agree. out. Just retweet it or not even a tweet, just a retweet. Yeah. I like if, and here's the thing is, and again, we're using Jordan as our example and we're going to say, Hey to uh, Jason, who's just popped in, but um, What's up, guys? Jordan, you know, he's been on both of our shows and he's liked the tweets. Why not just slide over a centimeter to the left and retweet? I don't think he liked mine even. Aha, <laughs> I got you. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, you're one up. Yeah. So everybody, Jason's co-hosting with me. He got caught up on a little bit of stuff. And actually, I last you cannot anymore last minute him because I was late to Eric because we had a, a time conflict thing. And then as I'm setting up, I'm like, oh, I wonder if Jason can do this. So I literally booked Jason as a co-host as as I was setting up the equipment. So thanks for making it, Jason. Uh, no problem. I just rushed in from D.C. It's been a long day, man. 
<laughs> yeah, I bet. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. We're just talking about podcasts in general, and uh, you know, I've I've been beating up Jordan Harbinger, who's been a guest on on Eric's show and my show. Uh, I don't know if you've had him or not yet. He's not a uh, first responder, but he certainly interviewed those guys. And I was just kind of holding him the task, and and sort of in general, guests in general. And you don't fall into this category, but when when you're on someone's show, on someone's podcast, especially as a fellow podcaster, just lift up the log a little bit with me here and, and give a retweet, do a share. You did awesome with that. Like you realize that we're working together, creating something neat. You want your audience to hear from you in a new way. And, and you don't mind my audience having access to your stuff. And I don't either because there's, there's plenty of attention to go around. Um, if my show is not good enough to, to keep my audience's attention, that's on me. And so if your show att- attracts their attention, God damn, good job, man. Way, way to go. But Jordan doesn't do that, and and it bugs me a little bit. But you know, I also don't mind having that conversation with him face to face. So we were well, just yeah, talking I give, about. That. I give a ton of props to Eric because Eric, <laughs> Eric actually went a step further and and found an audience that uh, doesn't quite lean on the same uh, networks that I pop up on here. And it was kind of neat that that they maybe saw things a little bit different from my point of view. If that makes sense. Especially when it comes to the wall and immigration and everything. So what what is Eric's audience? What do they see? How do they react to your appearance? I think they're they're pretty good. It was actually a Facebook group he attached me to after the podcast. I think it went pretty good. What do you think, Eric? Get a- they're open minded. I mean, everybody I deal with. Um, I'd like to say I pick the uh, best from mixed metal arts, but yeah, I, I uh, there's a ton of left wing people. And there's some right wing folks. And really, I try to toe the line. I'm fairly non-political, but I, I, don't, I don't know where to fall. But I knew that, you know, Jason has appeared on Fox over and over and over. And every outlet when I researched him was right wing. And I thought, well, well, put him in front of my people because believe me, there's some hardcore left wingers in there. I don't know if you've heard of uh, Daniele Bolelli. He does uh, History on Fire. I've had him on. He's pretty major podcaster. He's in Luminary now. He is definitely left wing. Definitely less left wing. A history teacher at the school, but he's a really good guy and open minded. And I think Jason does a good job representing himself as really just a. We, there's a problem. We need a solution. So in my like, episode I did with you, Eric, how did I how did I come off politically? It should be right down the middle. That's what I kind of aim for. I don't think we discuss politics, really. Good. I mean, we discuss situations. And that's sort of where I want to go. And I spent a lot of time with uh, Jason talking about that, where, well, let's look at um, breaking this down. Like, to me, huh, good, good call hey, back hey. there. Um, instead of... Um, looking at the entire picture, you need to itemize everything and then argue the points. So instead of saying, here's a universal picture and I fall this way, you fall that way. How about we just say, okay, who cares what we think about the big picture? Let's look at the hundred points or the 10 points. Now, point one, let's talk about it. Is this a problem? Yes or no. How do we address it? Yes or no. One of the things I find interesting is as you dig into something, and since politics is the thing we're kind of on, and I'm asking both of you guys this question, mm-hmm. when you look at the greater problem, you know, we're all looking at a different, you know, the part of the elephant that we're seeing, right? Like, am I looking at the tusk? Am I looking at the foot? Am right. I looking at the poop? Trying to decide what just came through this thing. And so I, I can I can say to the both of you, just keep your answer in your head. Don't say it out loud yet because we'll go to each of you. But if I said the number one thing I'd want from a president is what? And I'm going to ask you first, Eric. What's the number one attribute? That, like, they have to have this. What would it be? Curiosity. Okay. And then, Jason, what would your answer be? It'd be listen, you know. And don't listen to these talking heads and everybody else, but just listen to the people who have the ground truth. Boy, you know, I like the ground truth. You just speak in my language there. But look at that right there. So... A curiosity and a listen, similar parts of that elephant, right? But totally different. And you know as well as I do, we can, the next person might say honesty and the next person might say integrity and the next person might say character. But w- when you go to look for who we get, you know, I don't know that there are candidates out there. If we took the candidates that were 
that actually liked most of us, if we took the candidates that had a palatable position for most of us, there'd only be a couple of people there. And then when you started to apply character and other things, it gets really hard for these guys to stand out. So now we're looking at different things altogether than just an elephant, it seems like. What, what do you think or about that? Or even withstand. Even Say it to again? Withstand. Or to even withstand. Like you mentioned, looking at a candidate. Um, character comes up. Well, what about that candidate who was a doper, um, stole shit as a kid, or just was not a good kid? He's completely turned around. He learned a lot about life. He's learned humility. He's learned things through hard knocks. Well, sorry, can't have you. You got bad character. So ironically, some of the better candidates, the people who may have that humility, may have that curiosity or understanding, we're just going to cut them out right away. And the only people who are going to get through that door are the people who don't have things stick to them. So you could either have, uh, I'm, I'll just use Mitt Romney and Trump as counter examples. Mitt Romney is so freaking clean and bland and non-threatening pretty much all around that he just died. He's just kind of, eh. he's so vanilla which is ironic because vanilla is the most com complicated taste out there, but we'll leave that. And then you have Trump who was so in your face that nothing sticks to him. He's like gaudy of politicians. He just, everything you throw at him, he's like, yeah, what? Yeah, whatever. Okay. Yeah. And you know, that he was, you know, bought and paid for it. everybody knows. Hey, yeah, Romney's a good example of this. And I want to get back to the interviewing thing. Cause I think this kind of leads into it, but, if you recall when he was running, one of the things he said was, you know, as governor, he's like, I want to make sure we're considering women for these positions. Let's make sure we know who the candidates are. And they basically said, you know, we've women got women binders. Right. Instead of being a positive thing, the yep. dicks on the left turned that into a negative thing. And it's like, no, he's he sees a problem. He's trying to fix it. And so oh, you, yeah. hear, you have this guy that we would all want now instead of the president now. And for a lot of people would rather have Mitt Romney than Donald Trump. But because of the shitty way they treated it, and I'm not giving the right a pass, by the way. I'm just we're talking about the left specifically right now. They, you know, you have this thing. And so then it becomes, instead of someone doing their job as an interviewer and cleaning that up and saying, why is this perceived this way, Mitt? You know, we're, we're left with this perception that somehow ha having researched and understanding who the qualified women were was somehow a, a bad thing. What, what are your thoughts on that, Jason? I think we're just, you know, these mainstream media is just throwing softballs out there. They're kind of giving a heads up on what they're going to talk about, but they don't really delve deep into it. And the only time you see that is when you go into these, you know, 45 minute to 60 minutes. But everything in mainstream media, and, you know, because I've been on there, is about a seven minute sound bite. Yeah, seven minute so, sound bite. Yeah. In well, order seven to get minute to... segment with with multiple thirty second sound bites, you know. Yeah, exactly. Heaven forbid you make a mistake or you miss say something, you know. Like if if the world had recorded everything I said extemporaneously, I, they'd find out that I make a lot of mistakes, you know. Especially when I type, yeah. I I can't see half my mistakes. Well, that's the thing. Mitt might go up there and do a uh, speech for an hour, but it's just they're hitting them with thirty, forty questions, and they're not. And they have these questions written down and they're not doing like basic interview interrogation one-on-one is just talk to them and then just let them talk Yeah. and then dig deeper. Just, and then what, and then what, and right. what, why, you know, what do you think, Eric? I think they have an agenda. I mean, the truth is that everyone has an agenda. So I'm going to go one further on that. And some of these aren't necessarily driven by a higher organization they're driven by an echo chamber situation. Like if you feel one way about something, you tend to hang out with a crowd who feels the same way about whatever your views are. So then a job comes up. Who are you going to recommend for the job? Hey, I'm going to get my buddy in here. Now all of your buddies and you are saying the same thing. And this is left, this is right. So we get the echo chambers in there. So now anytime the question is going on, I'm saying that everyone's a bad actor. The truth is that if uh, you go on to the same side who likes you, they will ask the softball questions that will amplify your message. If you go on the side who does not like you, they will ask questions and 
manipulate your language in such a manner to put you down or to make you look poor, or they will constantly straw man you to death. And again, this is left, this is right. It is not, you know, any specific thing. It's weaponizing the language. And the problem is that the people doing it, they believe so strongly in their side, their Overton window is so far one direction or another that if you're just on the other side of that window, well, you might as well be a Nazi or you're a communist. Well, that that's one thing I see from both you and Eric is when you do the interviews, you're actually not just because we have time, time to talk. You're not throwing any softball questions out there. You're actually, you're digging deep into the story. You, you're kind of looking at it from all the perspectives, but it takes time. Yeah, so Jason and I talked about the border wall. We talked about school shootings and a, and a bunch of other oh. things. <laughs> Keep it light. Right? No, but here's the thing, though, right? <laughs> we didn't talk about them as political means and motives. Just like the stuff today that's in the news with Alabama and the abortion law. Please, I, I can't be bothered with that. You're talking about something that's so political, there is no solution to what they're, what's going on there. It's not even the first step. It's like we're having this national conversation about abortion, and it's had in the courtrooms, it's had in the legislature, and all that kind of thing. And to get into hysteronics about something that Alabama does, when you, when you live in another fucking state, Jesus Christ, you know, like, it, it, we've got to find a way to contain our business to within the bounds of our business, right? And so what Jason and I know about is the ground truth. So when we get into the border wall... Here, here's what Jason and I said. Like, there needs to be a lot more capacity so that you can give people aid who are coming into this country and get them processed so we can get them to the next level of aid. I think everybody agrees with that. Like, just about everybody I know is we want immigrants to come here. We just want to know who the heck you are, what kind of help you need. so we can. And we also don't want you dying in the desert from, from dehydration. So that's how we talked about it. We didn't talk about it as being a wall being moral or immoral. Or, or advancing some party's agenda. We talked about it in terms of when you're on the ground and you absolutely have no more time to do anything else and there's people still dying in the desert, are we better than that? Separated families? Okay, great. More capacity, more federal agents. That has to be part of that answer. Sounds good, but how are we doing? Uh, let, let's take, for example, um, you could have aid being promised across the line but then you'll have somebody who, uh, I don't know how to put it, but a, a great example of this was um, when one of the bills came up, Trump had backed down a lot of elements of it. And one of the people who voted against it, though, was Ocasio-Cortez. She actually voted with the Republicans against the Democrat bill. Why? Because they funded ICE at all. Right. And it's like, this is all purity. And that's part of the problem, too, is I cannot stand purity. Uh, I, I feel like half of the problems with the electorate is I would like, um, first off, you should not be able to vote down the line by a party. Your sorry ass needs to pick each individual person. That's number one. And they have that. They have it like in, I believe, Oklahoma, where you could just go in and say, give me the Republican ticket, check, boom, all, all right down the line. That's garbage. I'd like to go one further. I'd like to scramble the names on the ballot in different order and remove party affiliation from all names. So you have to actually research every individual if you go in there, or you could just throw um, darts at it. I'm fine with either. What about you? What about you, Jason? How, how do you, I hate to get us derailed into a, a political conversation, but it seems like that's where we're going. If you could change one thing, what would you change? Oh, man. Now we're talking about voting and everything else. I don't know. What would I change? I'd like to I'd like to really make these politicians see what's going on. You know, I'm so sick of these, you know, five minute sound bites down by the border or they they show up here and there. But I want them to actually have to live with the consequences, meet these families, uh, meet the people working the, the jobs or, or any bill they have to really sign off on know what the hell they're signing. Yeah, know what the hell they're signing and understand what the challenges are on the ground. You know, there's a zillion different problems. Let me try to get us back on to hosting a podcast, but this is this is interesting stuff because it does go to what we do. So Eric and Jason, as you guys approach these conversations, Eric's talking to 
uh, a variety of people. Jason's more talking to first responder, uh, combat guys like me, that kind of thing. Are you guys thinking politically anywhere near the top of your priority list on how you want to align a conversation or, or is that just sort of an ancillary thing for you? How, how would you characterize your, your prioritization of politics in your hosting, Eric? Unless I'm interviewing someone who is specifically a party type, like I've had Austin Peterson, libertarian runner up presidential candidate, I went political on him mm -hmm. because that's who he is. He's a politician. Um, I have uh, Dr. Chris Meltzler coming on, uh, or Metzler, sorry. He is a known black conservative that's very relevant to him because that's his whole identity. He is a black conservative pundit. I speak about that. Um, same thing with um, Congressional Dish, Jennifer Briney. Her whole function in life is lit watching C-SPAN, so we don't have to. <laughs> and trailing Congress. So with them, yes. Anyone else? No. Because what does it get me? What's the relevance? So, okay, so you're prepping for Jason's interview, and I'm going to come back to Jason on that same question. You're prepping for Jason's interview, and you see the kind of work he's done, more on the first responder side, more on the action side, and you think to yourself, I'm not worried about politics in this one, and so you're just kind of not even prep for that. Is that fair to say? With him, actually, okay, I'll back off a little, because I did think politically, but I thought the best way I could help Jason is to challenge him as much as possible. In no, a, that's exactly what you did, and I'm, I'm glad you did. I look forward to the challenge. I want to talk about, you know, it's not just a black and white situation at the border. It's very gray. And I like when people actually talk about all these different aspects of it. Like me, the big thing you'll see is I'll be like, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm pretty straight down the line. Um, I believe in border security, but I, I also believe in addiction counseling. No, I, I believe in it. It's a it's a three sector policy. You know, it's it's the stuff going on down south. It's a smuggling, it's a human trafficking. You got to secure the border one way or the other. Um, and then you also have to have addiction counseling up here because, the, you know, it's supply and demand up here. And as long as you have people demanding narcotics, you're always going to have it, you know. And that's that's one of the things that I would think about. I always think about whenever I want whenever I talk, I want to portray that view out there. But it's always a, a seven minute soundbite where it's like, hey, let's talk about the wall. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about the wall because that's what sells the uh, the ads, right? Is getting people to go crazy about the wall, and hopefully they they go crazy in both directions, where they're super stoked about the wall, and they're also commenting on everything about the wall because they hate you for talking about the wall. Like, <laughs> and well, that, those aren't the seeds yeah. that I think we're trying to sow. Is that right? No, and and one thing just to backtrack to, you know, the the question about Eric and politics and everything, is my podcast is the same. I do not talk about politics at all, you know, and that's why I started the podcast is because I wanted to have inspirational stories from people on the ground. You know, that could be military, law enforcement, first responders, and those that support them. And if anybody kind of heads into the political direction, I kind of push it out. Kind of just start to change the subject or go, yeah, exactly. kind of laugh with it and go. It. Or you know what? Here's another trick. Cut it and post. Let them get it out exactly. there and just cut that part out. I did that the other day with the guest. I'll never say who it was, but but they got into a lather and they got going. And I'm like, mm, okay, so here's one of the things that I do. I edit in my head as I'm talking. Like I, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do an example. I'll start to say something and I'll get up. I'll start to say something and I'll realize it's not going the way I want to go. And I'll say it again. And I'll also hear what Eric says. And maybe I prompt him to say it again. Or maybe I ask the question in a clearer way. And I'll cut all the stuff that I don't want out. The content is still the same. But I just get the better version of Eric. Because he gets a second shot at it. Or I get a second shot at it most of the time. Well, but you cool. guys we can talk are... methodology now. Say it again? We can talk methodology now. No, because this is, I think, people will be interested in. Yeah. yeah. So actually... are you guys editing live in your heads? I mean, obviously you don't do it in the moment. But you're like... Edit point. Let me fix this. I now. am, except mine's different. My goal in life is to be doing a live show. Okay. So I try to pretend that every interview is live. I get one shot. If I screw it up, I say I screw it up and I roll with it. So it's a, it, it's a little different. I, I like what you're doing. That's giving a more polished show, but I'm kind of trying to walk a high wire. So yes, I'm editing my head, 
but I'm trying to shape my message as I go um, can be excruciating at times, but I'm planning for no edit. I'm planning for recorded live. I like it. What about you, Jason? I like that, yeah. No, I, I think that's great. And you know, actually, you know, I'm a I'm a novice podcaster, so I'm learning for both of you guys. And what I usually do is I usually keep a notebook next to me, and I uh, I just take if someone makes a call for anything. I'm looking at the time. I do a little check mark. Say, okay, go back there and make sure that's fixed. Yep. I'm kind of editing on the fly because my shows are only going 25, 50 minutes. Um, but I am trying to polish it up, and that means having good audio, good conversations straight through but i love i love what eric's talking about a live um a live broadcast would be perfect and listening to you both when we talk i always you know and i don't know if this is because i'm on tv or anything i'm always listening for the ums or the uhs and the uh and i my whole thing is just make sure if anybody even a guest does that I make a little check mark and make sure that, you know, sure. you try to get that out. We don't want um machines. And I will go through if somebody's an um machine or uh, um stammering and wait, I was stammering and I'm repeat and um uh-huh. I, I'm gonna go through it because that's just gonna make everybody freaking crazy. But yeah. I'm still gonna treat everything as live. So it, it's a weird compromise. I do know that later on the um machine's gonna get out if I actually do a live show. Now that's one thing I want to ask both of you. Now, audio podcast. Do you plan to go visual in the future? Uh, if I could avoid it, I'd never do it. I think I may do something with like get vocal. That's something you guys may want to check out too. We could talk about it uh, offline, but yeah, people come in and out, and it's really cool. I don't see the need for video in terms of the quality of the show that I create. Uh, who the hell cares if I'm sitting there and you can look at me, talk to somebody else. I know there's a lot of shows that do that and that's a very normal format, but I also like to polish the show. I like to have the guest be as clean and clear as possible. So that means jump cuts in video and it means a lot more time in production. So I would rather produce more quality audio content and then maybe create a whole new show where it's me and a very high profile guest in two chairs and two ferns, that kind of thing. But in terms of the break it down show, yes, but I don't know what that is. And in the meantime, I'm just going to keep pumping out four shows a week so that, you know, I was already a good interviewer before I started this business. Jason, you know how it is when you're in the field talking to people every day. I have had so many interviews before I ever started this that I already had a high level. And I've tuned tuned those tools and I've identified them. So for me, the audio stands up on its own. And if someone doesn't have time for that, then, then they're not part of my audience. They're just not into what I'm into. I would rather have a deep, involved conversation and then the video be secondary but I do recognize that video has its place in the market. That leads me on to the next thing, too, is Eric. Now, the Break It Down shows, they go mobile. And that's kind of my next my next step is going mobile. You know, running out there with the, uh, with the mobile setup, talking to people uh, sure. in their settings. Now, are you going to – do you plan on doing that in a few? I have done it. Um, not much. But three of my interviews were at a Podcast Movement. I'll be at MapCon this year. That's not far away from you. We should uh, – well, I don't know if it is or not. It's in Atlantic City. You're closer to D.C., right? Yeah, I'm right up the road from you, I think. I think we're promos neighbors. Atlantic City is my hometown. I'll go with you. Let's go. We'll okay. Go. Well, that's an example. I'll be doing live interviews there with people. But in general, I'm in Hampton Roads. Who am I going to talk to? There's not a really lot of higher profile people. And to be honest, it's a pain in the ass in my eyes because I have a day job. I have to get that done. I can get done from the day job, quickly change clothes real, and jump right on this microphone. Boom. I've got a video session. I've wasted almost no time. It's part of the reason I like running because I can get home, throw on the clothes, get on my shoes, and I'm running on the sidewalk. I don't have to drive to the gym, go get a shower, and waste all this time. Any way I can cut the time out, I need to. I just don't have the time to handle this stuff. 
This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at PDA Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Go get a shower and waste all this time. Any way I can cut the time out, I need to. I just don't have the time to handle this stuff. Well, that brings us where, you know, it seems like every podcaster I know is a full-timer. I mean, we have day jobs and, you know, we all have our, our different setups right now. I'm looking at all three of you, all two of you, and we're all looking <laughs> at different setups. And that's the thing is. You know, if we're talking about podcasts, everybody always likes to know about what kind of equipment you're using and and how you get it going. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what I use. I use a Zoom H6, which you can see right here is live. And right now I'm using a Shure Lavalier mic. I think it's a XM93. Um, and I do those things. And I normally have a headset, and that's right over here too. But I have specific reasons for doing that. One, I want a mic that's focused on my mouth, not omnidirectional. Two, not all my guests are seasoned on the mic. Some of them are rookies. So if I put a mic right there in their mouth with a boom mic, mm -hmm. then they can't get away from where I want the mic to be the whole time. It makes them sound better. It gives the audience a better experience. And, and my, my setup is super small. And I'll show you my headset. That's my headset right there. That's nothing. It's just it's the smallest headset you can have, basically, for, for a reasonable amount of money. So... I hope people ask me about my setup because I don't I don't want you to have to for someone who wants to be mobile and portable like I am I don't want you to have to have table stands or booms or anything else I want I want your stuff to go in one bag not even as big as a backpack so you can get out there and get after it with the quality so go ahead Eric I was gonna say if you are doing mobile though make sure you get a mic that doesn't reflect hand noise that's really really important I got to give you props to Eric because I was using that Blue Yeti. And uh, oh, God. I gave it to my I oh, gave God. it to my son now. He so he uses it for gaming, but yeah. now I'm using this uh, Audio Technica, and I love it. It's just a handheld mic, sit on my couch, and I I can just talk. I can do my podcast anywhere now. So Eric, give give us another pro tip. You said g get a mic that doesn't pick up hand noise. You're obviously using a mega badass mic, that sure mic that you're using. Um, what's another it's overkill. What's another pro tip? Okay, well one uh, real quick to Jason, I can hear the hand noise on your microphone. Try wrapping your cord up and hold the cord wrapped in a loop by your microphone on the side, and that'll eliminate that. Okay. And, uh, and don't forget, I got you. I'll clean you up. Don't I, just like I did this morning. <laughs> but uh, there you go. That's a tip. Uh, don't don't spend too much money. Uh, another pro tip is just get something out there, and you can do it on the sly. Like I'd recommend if you want to do a show, you don't know exactly what you want to do. Like let's say it's a solo show, go on anchor, get your freaking phone in a closet and go in a closet and you can record very cleanly on an iPhone into the anchor app or Android and anchor app. And it's free. You could just share it with a few friends and just do it a few times. See, get a rhythm, get a voice, figure out what you want to do. If you really like it, you just download the audio and you put it up in a real host. If you don't like it, well, who cares? It's out there. Because the truth is that, like anything else, you got to suck. You got to suck for a while. Yeah, I I definitely learned that lesson. <laughs> My first few episodes, and I had really good guests on too. The first few, and I I feel really bad for you know bringing them on a crappy audio sounding podcast, and now learning how to clean it up and learning how to. At le learning today how to get rid of hand noise <laughs> but those types of things i, I kind of feel like and i know you both have probably had this issue is we're like you're done with an episode and you're like man i think i screwed up that audio did i ask you're satisfied question? you're not a podcaster yeah yeah but you do have a point where you have to say this is going up like i've got a couple shows oh, right yeah. now that just aren't good enough quality and I will re-record those. And I'll tell the guests, like, it's just not good enough. I don't want to put this out there for you. I want you to have something better. And there needs to be that line. Anything above that line is publishable. Get it the fuck out and get it on to the next one. 
You can't mm-hmm. you can't slow down for perfection. It's all about production in our world. Otherwise, you're going to get smashed by your ego and your fear, and so you have sure. to put it out. Sure. And uh, what's ironic, and I'm sure both of you have had this. I've gone into interviews thinking, especially when I'm done and through the interview, I'm like, oh, this is going to be the best freaking interview ever. Then I listen to him like, you know, I really kind of dropped the ball there. <laughs> uh, you know, man, I really had the yes. curse of knowledge. Yeah. And then another one, I'm like, oh, I just don't know about this. I just don't know. I mean, eh, I guess it's okay, but... And then I get feedback from a bunch of people. They're like, oh my God, that was amazing. And while I'm editing, I'm like, it's not, it's not that bad, really. And yeah. I, I can't make sense of it. It's, <laughs> it's sort of like, what show is going to be popular? I'm sure you guys have put a show out. You're like, oh, I got this guest. It's going to be amazing. Everybody's going to line up around the block to listen to it. And it's crickets. Then you put somebody out. Nobody's ever really heard of. And it just gets legs. And that's where I'm trying to focus so much more on content and stories. And I recommend another pro tip, stop chasing the influencers. Exactly. You know, and that's one thing about some of these guests I've had on. I had uh, I had Vic Avalon, and he was in an ICE agent down in Mexico, and he got ambushed. And, you know, I, I told him in the beginning, because Vic and I are friends. And I'm like, hey, we don't really have to go into the ambush. But he, uh, <laughs> he went into it, and it was the most amazing 20 minutes of a story I've ever heard in my life. And, you know, and this is coming from someone that's been in law enforcement almost 20 years and war and everything else. But when Vic told me that story, man, it was like the best thing ever. But then I'm like, well, how do I promote this? So that's the next that. step. Yeah, definitely. You have to check it out. Headliner.app, pull harrowing points and leave it at a cliffhanger. So it's about a minute of audio. You do it with, you know, the audio band underneath and the transcriptions there popping underneath. I was about to see it. I look up, there was a gun in my face. Boom. That's it. That's how you promote it. Say that app again so everybody can hear it. Headliner.app. Literally .app. Fantastic. It's free. I'm going to kick out a pro tip for everybody. And this is not a common thing. And this is not a, this is truly an advanced skill. So don't feel like you have to get right into it. But the less you say, the more you can use sound or silence to your advantage, the better questions you'll ask. And the less you ask interrogative-based questions, which are closed questions, the better. Now, you ask a closed question for sure when you want to take control of a conversation. So a closed question is, uh, isn't that true, Eric? Yes or no? You know, a yes, no kind of question. But also, closed questions are who, what, where, when, why, how. If you can avoid those interrogatives when you start your question, you're going to get to a deeper state of the guest's mind where they're sorting through something. If you open with a interrogative-based question, that's fine. Recognize your mistake and then ask them for their opinion or to surmise or to expand. Give me more on this. Give me an example of that. Those things, those questions that aren't questions are infinitely more powerful and unlock your guest's mind and give you control in a way where it never seems like you've done a thing, but you're total control of a conversation that's running wild and free. So everybody sees a wild pony running for the fence, and they have mm-hmm. no idea the whole time you're masterminding this conversation. So avoid interrogatives. It's not an easy thing to do, but it is the best thing you can do. There are times that it can be useful, though, especially as you put it when you're trying to gain control or you want to send somebody running down a particular trail. For sure. Know. Yeah, to seek control, because, absolutely. Close the question off. The, the worst thing in the world is, oh, so tell me about yourself. Please never say that. Please never say that. Because I'll probably think about shutting it off immediately. I want to know very specifically, why do you have this person on your show? Why do I care? So that's a perfect example of a leading it would be like, uh, Pete, I understand that you're a spy in the army. How does that work? Now, I, I very specifically went down a, a, a tighter path here. Or 
how what makes somebody want to do that? Now you may have a short statement, but then I can spawn out. We've established a direction. You could also say though, hey Pete, I heard you were a spy in the army. And just do that. And let that, yeah, not, let not that silence the ask the question. That's true. But and I know what you're doing with the Dan Rather element on that, but yeah. it doesn't always that silence usually is great in a follow-up, especially when you answer something and then I just shut up. Well, keep in mind, too, I edit my show, so I can take that silence and I can shorten it up oh, so it's, it's a short question. Oh, no, I totally agree. But yeah. I'm saying that it's also effective, not in me asking you the question, but when you give me an answer, if I just sit there silently, you may continue because it's uncomfortable. A lot of silence right there. <laughs> a lot of silence. <laughs> Leaving room for you, Jason. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at it as an interview and interrogation. Because I've had, I don't know how many hundreds of people across True. the desk for me. And this, you know, it's almost like you want to give someone an out. Mm -hmm. Now, Pete knows what an out is. I'm sure you do, too. It's where you always kind of like when you're when you're talking to someone and you hit a, a silent or a dead spot where the conversation is going nowhere. Well, you think in your mind, how am I going to get them to talk some more? And uh, how am I going to get them to hold on to their story or, or grasp something? And that's the thing. It's like when you're talking to someone, give them up. Like, hey, so, you know, there you were, blah, blah, blah. You committed that war crime, didn't you? <laughs> and they're like, uh, there's your out. No, but there's your out. <laughs> no. And then they start talking. The hell no, I didn't. And this is why I didn't do it. <laughs> Well, and I'm sure that when you guys are interrogating or something, you might be like, I don't know, you see a piece of jewelry on them if they have it, if they're a civilian, you'd be like, that's a nice ring. Yeah. yeah the thing with, with any kind of field expedient interview or interrogation, you're trying to do very specific things. And so let, let's say that, um, you know, there's a hundred questions that I want to get the answer to. Where are the bombs? Who are the bad guys? What's going to happen next? Those kind of questions. And those are questions that are asked in a vacuum by people who aren't on the ground and have the ground truth. So I literally can't go up to someone and say, where are the bombs? Because that's just never going to get answered. There's <laughs> nobody that does it like that successfully that I've ever met. So you've sure. got to have the question before that. And then what's the question before that? And what's the question before that? So you, you reverse plan your questions to hopefully get to the place where you're at. But because you can't always get to where are the bombs, you have little branches to break off of that stream and into another one so that whatever topic you're into, you can get to one of your goal questions because you've, you've, they're not leading questions, but they're questions that allow an answer that you can use to get mm -hmm. to the next level answer. Does that make sense? Sure. And the thing too that's interesting is you guys are both coming from interviews that matter. No offense, but yeah. I'm coming from the entertainment <laughs> side. I'm doing this. Hopefully we learn something. Hopefully we have a good time. Hopefully we have an engaging conversation. You're coming from, okay, this is life or death. Soldiers will potentially die. And you're kind of almost tempering it down. I'm sort of coming from the whole, well, I don't want to piss them off necessarily, mm -hmm. but I also want to uh, generate content that is interesting to my audience. Like, I don't know, we weren't even two minutes into it and I was pushing Pete back. But I do that a little bit, not necessarily hard. I know I push Jason, but some well, of that helps. Let's backtrack a little bit. Now, you do, do you do your homework, both of you guys, on who your guests are going to be? Or do you want to go in there cold? What kind oh, of like, homework, like let me. the conversation. Go ahead, Eric. Homework, uh, six to 10 hours on average. And the weird thing is, though, I'm also willing to throw it all out. So a lot of times the homework is just to get an idea of who they are, or what, how they're built in my mind, or to get possibly a handle that I can go down. Like I might do a Mark Maron type of speculation to draw something out. I, I, I don't know. It, it's very instinctive. An example, Chris Voss, he's been interviewed, you know, dozens of times. He's big time interviewee, FBI negotiator. How do you go into that one? My angle was just by listening to me, getting a vibe about him and his personality. 
I was saying, you're from Iowa, right? And he's like, yeah. I said, then why do you, you know, is this like in the army? I said, you sound like you're from New York. I said, are you, uh, is it like in the army where everybody sounds Southern over time? Does that happen with FBI guys in New York? And he just starts laughing and he starts going, well, yeah, you got to hang out with the cops. And so is I'm trying to get either a piece of insight or a laugh or just something to where we can early on, especially maybe be human. I suppose my answer to this question might sound a little bit arrogant, but understand that it comes from hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of interview time. I do a level of prep to where I'm comfortable with the lack of prep that I've done. So, um, like, I, I know that I can talk to Eric because Eric has a podcast. So that checks a lot of blocks off of my list. Hmm. And then because I've asked a million questions, there's, there's no question that I'm uncomfortable with. So I can find something. And if I find an area that doesn't work, I know how to back out of it and go forward again. So a lot of my prep is already done in, in where I've been. It doesn't mean that I don't have prep. It doesn't mean that I'm not looking for something in particular. But if I do go into Eric's background and look... I'm looking for one or two things, and once I have that, I'm good. I don't need to do anything else because everything else will show up. One area where I make an exception to that is if I have someone that's done a zillion interviews, I want to ask original questions or purposely acknowledge all of the questions that have been. Like uh, we had Josh Montz on the show, and Josh Montz was shot and killed by a sniper 12 years ago. He was dead for 15 minutes, and they brought him back. Holy shit, that's incredible. Everybody's covered it. So right up front, you say, that's all good. Josh has done a lot of things since he died. Let's get into those things. And then mm-hmm. you let Josh be incredible at that point because he is like, the dude is alive. So you just let him do all of the work. And this is that whole thing of I'm in control of the conversation, but I'm letting him run as fast as he can. And every now and then I nudge him towards where I want to go. That's where my prep is going is is not in, in, in the specifics of the person's background, because they'll tell me all that stuff if I want it, but, but in how do I get this person going as fast as I can, as soon as I can. Yeah, it's just a stylistic thing. You're doing more of the um, Larry King. Sure. Larry King goes in blind, literally. You just say who the name, what's their name, and what do they do? He's off. That's yeah. all he wants. Uh, both have their place. Sure. Uh, I'm you know, totally into both. I, I mean, I'm a walking contradiction. I do a ton of research. I have a ton of prep questions, but then I have an informal conversation. Go figure. That's a, mine is a, a scratch pad. And I like to look, I like to have, you know, the basic concept, but I'm learning. I'm, I'm learning this podcast thing uh, big time that uh, you got to really, I, I'm leaning towards doing a little bit more research and letting the conversation go where, it goes. But the other thing too is originality. Mm-hmm. You know, and both of you guys have mentioned that is having original questions because a lot of these guests, uh, your guests, my guests, everybody's guests have, you know, they've been asked the same exact questions. And you could tell when they go from, you know, they're having like a really good conversation to the canned response. It, it's a complete tonal change. Talking point time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's like, okay, you've been interviewed by me. Um, Jason, how many of my questions have you heard before? Hmm. Now, I th- you know, that's one thing I give a lot of kudos to both of you is I didn't get, I've never really talked like we talked. It was really this just very open conversation type. So, uh, yeah, I can't, I don't remember ever getting answered. You know, somewhere like, you know, the basic, when you throw the wall in there, I, you could probably tell when I go right into the canned response. Because I have I have 50 talking points for the wall and the border and immigration. It's sure. just because they're the things I know. That's my subject matter expertise. But when we start talking, like Pete and I went off way off on the edge <laughs> talking about, uh, you know, our terrorism days and, you know, how we could vet people and all this other stuff. And nobody ever asked me, like, the real questions about the real security issues at the border. But both of you guys have hit on those on those aspects, which, I, you know you could tell there's research there. Yeah. Yeah. And again, a lot of my research is field time, right? I know about screening and vetting and what it takes. And uh, when you tell me 10,000 people or a hundred thousand people show up at a gate and I look around, they're like, there's four more of me. You know, this line is never going to get anything but longer. There's a problem right there. We can discuss all day long. And you know how hard it is to sit there and just crank out 
in good quality interviews that are assessing a person and you get one shot, one shot. It's like, why would you talk about anything else except for to describe how impossible gaining access to this country is to an interview? Like, yeah, we're going to, most of my interviews are going to be shit because you can only do so good with that. That to me is infinitely more interesting than uh, whether or not a wall is moral or not, because there are not enough people to even handle what's coming through. So wall, no wall, Walmart, who fucking cares? Right. And Jason, and I went into my bent on legalization to help stem some of the demand. You know, it, there's different, you know, different uh, policies and angles. Well, that's one thing. The next question is, how do you avoid those rabbit holes? Because, you know, we can go down rabbit holes all day long when it comes to something, but you don't want to get your audience disengaged from what the original topic was. Two ways, change the subject or editing later. Editing. I think that should be the next question for both of you guys. Um, is your editing style? What are you doing? Editing wise, in general, I will run through isotope, for example, try to clean up. Uh, for example, somebody uses a Yeti, try to pull the reverb out, things like that. Just some basic automatic things. Then I would go through and listen. If they're not on machine, I'm going to be very, very light in the touch. And I'll just go through, skip chunks. Be like, okay, good. Okay, good. Okay, good. If they're an on machine, then I'll be like, mm, let me cut some of these out. I won't cut them all out because they don't sound human. People naturally will say, um, and uh, occasionally, but you might have somebody who says, um, you know, um, you know, um, you know, three times in 10 seconds. That's, that's a little much. Now, a uh, pro tip on that, I got this from uh, Jason Piccolo. Uh, no, Jesus. <laughs> um, I, I completely blanked the name, but Jason of uh, Jordan Harbinger Show. Uh, yeah. DeFrank. Yeah. Uh, DeFilippo. 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 Say it By again. the way, the two Jasons I did a week apart, Jason DeFilippo and Jason Piccolo are back to back episodes. So I threw my brain for a loop. Anyway, uh, Jason DeFilippo pointed out pro tip that as you're cutting the ums out, later on in the show, you can cut fewer of them because people get used to them as they go along. That's true. So that, that's pretty much it. And then um, throw, you know, tag on the intro, tag on the end pieces, and then run it through Auphonic to bring the levels to the same volume on both, you know, both sides. I uh, do something totally different. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> well, so, and I know Eric knows some of these things, like I'm having him record his track. So ideally I would have Jason record his as well, because that's the best way to get the most quality in the first shot. I want to put the best show I can into the can the first time. So if I'm going in a rabbit hole, I don't want to go there. I just say, stop. And I, I'm, I'm the producer at that point. I don't want to talk about this. Let's talk about, and you change the subject and you, you do it. I'm doing it directly and abruptly here. And sometimes I do that in studio, but usually it's a lot more gentle and they won't even know. And I'll just cut that unwanted piece out. I'll just edit that live in my head and remember, okay, I've got, I change gears there and I have to go ahead and change that around. But the other thing that I do is I go in, I, I fix the sound that's there. I take out unwanted noise. Um, and, and I'm looking to do as little as possible because the more you do, the longer it takes. I'm going to mm -hmm. go pull those ums and ahs out. Jason is right. But as you go along, the ums and ahs tend to disappear unless the person is really colloquial and it's just everywhere. And then so sometimes I just leave that stuff because it's just, it's not fair to that person and how they talk. But I do spend a lot of time cleaning those things out. to find. I try to find the least amount of work I can do to make the best representation of that person. And so that is most of it. And from I would say way over 90% of the time, I don't touch any of the content points other than just to take out stutters and stumbles. I don't touch anything that they say uh, unless they say, hey, take this part out. And that's really less than 10% of the time that that happens. So most of my editing is thorough. I go through the whole show. It takes a long time. But I'm looking for very specific things to clean up. And that's mostly what I do. I would say I clean up and, and that's the bulk of what you see, but I'm very particular about how I clean up. Now, one thing I see you doing, Pete, is you're interviewing people at a restaurant. Yeah. 
and it is a very natural environment. And one thing I like about it is you're hearing you're in nature. You're, I mean, you're that restaurant is nature because you're hearing the clanging of the dishes in the background. Yeah. So it kind of feels natural for the audience. I think that's kind of a, a cool point if you're out there going in public that you're not just, you know, you're, you're not editing out that element. Yeah. I like to, so, and there is some magic that's going on with that sound. Like uh, for a long time I had, I didn't have all the same mics and that's probably always going to be the case. And so one of them will pick up more sound than the others. And I'll usually bury the sound of that channel, but only bring in the background noise. It's purposeful when it's there and how much I leave it in there. And sometimes it's, it's completely taken out. But I do. I like the vibe of it. Not everybody does. So I am mindful of that. But there is, there is some artistry going on for sure when I'm, when I'm managing that part of what I do. One thing on the double ending, by the way. Um, you mentioned I'm recording my side. That's called a double ender for anyone listening. I actually use software called Squadcast that double ends through a browser. So it takes care of that for me. And the moron Eric, it appears, has left a freaking tab open. So let me go chase that one down. All right, there we go. Yeah, uh, another pro tip. Close tabs, especially Facebook, so you don't have the dings and dongs. Da dong Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let, let's wrap this up because we've been doing this for quite a while and, and uh, you know, you guys got other things to do. But I wanted to just, in general, the two of you have been doing podcasts. Jason, yours is new, you're on the way, and I'm excited for you. So let's ask you first, since you started your show just a short time ago, how have you evolved? Um, more relaxed, you know, letting, not being, just jumping into it being, Hey, you know what? Tell me, tell me about this, blah, blah, blah. Just being more relaxed, uh, letting them talk. Cause uh, being on the other side of the mic, uh, a million times more than my own podcast, I'm used to doing a lot of the talking, but it's, I'm learning to just sit back, relax, let the conversation flow. So that's, that's what I'm learning. And Eric, your evolution is going to be more severe. So describe the biggest area of growth that shocks you the most. The biggest thing that I learned was I started out wanting to kiss every guest's ass and make it all about the guest to be my friend. I came to learn over time, though, that it's about the show and it's about the audience. And that was a hard one lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Man, those are great answers. Those are perfect, like, such great notes on being a host because everybody thinks, turns out, everybody thinks they know how to host a podcast until you got to do that shit and listen to what you say. Oh, man. Like, you think you don't like your voice. Then you listen to the words that you pick and you're like, I am the world's biggest dick. I can't say anything right. And it's so funny when, when you realize your ass history, your ego, you're not listening, all these things that you think you're doing and you're clearly not doing. It's, it's a shocker. So uh, anybody who's trying to do a podcast should definitely, definitely accept the fact that they're going to make a lot of mistakes and not be they're going to be way too hard on themselves and they should ease up a little bit and just keep creating. You'll get better no matter what. Every podcast is a journey podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I use Anthony Ian Arino's example. He, he says, and, and this is true for so many things. It's like swimming. If I described to you how to do the Australian crawl, you would not, you would die. You would die. <laughs> you would like, uh, I made it two feet and had to get back to the wall. How do I like, Hosting is, is not easier than that. It, you're putting yourself out there to do something that's exceptionally hard. And like my stroke when I swim, and I swim quite a bit now, is totally different than someone who's fast and efficient and done it their whole life. I've swam my whole life, but I've not swam laps my whole life. So sure. though I know how to swim laps, I can swim indefinitely. My stroke, totally different than Eric's stroke, totally different than Jason's. And, and that's all right. It's all right to know that my stroke is like a... I like to say my, my, my stroke when I swim literally is like a sanitation truck, like the shitter sucker truck. It, <laughs> it ain't pretty. It, it, you don't want to look at it, but I'll be goddamned. At the end of the day, I'm touching the wall over and over again like everybody else. <laughs> that is Perfect. a great analogy, right? <laughs> yep. Perfect note to hang up on there. <laughs> All right, fellas. Well, listen, uh, let's do some more of these. These are fun. 
And uh, well, that's I, great. Yeah, I appreciate you guys coming on. I appreciate you, Jason, a last second hopping in, yeah, man. Hit me up whenever you need to co-host. Same thing, Eric. If you want to do the Atlantic City thing, man, I'll cruise down there. With, what is that you're going to? Uh, I'm speaking at MapCon up there. So um, Mid-Atlanta Podcast Concert. Uh, oh, very cool. Conference, nice. sorry. When is that? Plug that so everybody can hear. Uh, September 6th through 7th in Atlantic City. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for listening. I know this is kind of just a, a, a fun thing, but there is so much to learn about podcasting. So many people ask me questions about all these things, and we got the stuff that people don't normally ever even get to. So we did. A, we got a good show in here, and, and I'm really proud of it. And I appreciate you guys for being my friends and coming on. Well, thank you, man. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Eric.